Okay, grade nine, I hope that you are doing well. I just need to grab your attention upon the projects. The projects must be delivered by next week maximum. The project must be delivered by next week maximum. Okay? Uh, it says teacher in April 22. Yeah, because of uh, the new idea and also that uh, the king uh, has changed it. The exam timetable, consequently, the projects must be delivered by next week. By next week okay? So just try to do your best in order to end them as soon as possible. All right. So teacher, I hope. Teacher. Yes. Yes. Do we uh, have to present the projects or what? You will have to present, uh, present them also. Teacher, why? Because uh, we don't have time, teacher. We have to do the project then uh, present it. Only one quarter. Uh, it's okay. So you, you don't have time exactly uh, in what you're gonna do. do you're gonna you're gonna do them, right, Ryan? Yes. So and the time is during the session. So what time exactly are you speaking about? Because I'm confused right now. If you're speaking no, about no. the time so, of making them, you're gonna do them. Whether you present or didn't present, you're gonna do them, but you will present during the session. Okay. So, okay. okay. So once again, we have spoken already about uh, one of uh, the most important civilization of uh, the most immortal, which was uh, the Ottoman and the Soviet empires. To speak about both the Ottoman and the Soviet, we'll just start by a quick revision, then we will continue by the decline of the Soviet. Before we start our revision and our new topic, is there any question you need to ask about what we have already covered? Okay. So, after both uh, the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasties, of course, the Umayyad, they were uh, centralized in uh, Damascus, and later came the Abbasids, and they were centralized in uh, Baghdad. From those two civilizations of the Muslim empire, they stretches from uh, both uh, the Indus Valley River in this place here until Spain, and of course, token most of uh, Northern Africa and that civilization. So it was one of the most magnificent civilization over the course of history. But of course, later, because uh, of becoming an aging dynasty, the Abbasid dynasty started to decline. Uh, after the Abbasid dynasty started to decline, some Turkish speaking people uh, from the Balkan Peninsula they started to move and take over uh, other uh, cities. Uh, they started first by uh, the city of uh, Constantinople, which later uh, they called Istanbul. Uh, that city actually it worked as the, the gate for all of uh, the European continent. Uh, so to take this city, it was a very, very huge triumph for uh, the Muslim people back then. Uh, once uh, they started to take control of that, uh, uh, civilization or that city they started to construct uh, the ottoman uh, civilization or the ottoman empire or even the ottoman dynasty so by just taking control of this whole uh, peninsula the Balkan peninsula they now started to move uh, around the peninsula they now have uh, number one europe number two asia and number three africa and in order to take control of all of these uh, countries and also all of these continents, they needed much power and also a lot of uh, well. So they started first by trying to move uh, towards Bulgaria, but unfortunately Bulgaria, it was very strong and it worked as uh, the defensive uh, gates for all of the continent of uh, Europe. That's why it took them many, many years in order to penetrate uh, Bulgaria. But once, of course, they penetrated Bulgaria, started to move to Romania, Siberia, Hungary, until uh, they uh, moved to Austria and uh, they uh, tried to take uh, the city of Vienna. Yes, unfortunately, they were not able to take the city of Vienna at that time by uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. So, Sultan uh, Suleiman actually he had other places to fight in, and that was one of the, the wrong things that uh, the Ottoman did. 
okay because they started first to march towards uh, europe and started to take all of the, the cities until uh, vienna they marched towards to vienna and they seized it for approximately three months uh, and later because they were fighting other uh, worlds uh, which was uh, in both uh, asia and also in africa they started to take uh, the cities all of these cities damascus uh, palestine both mecca and medina iraq egypt and they also reach to parts of northern africa like tunisia and algeria nowadays so that was from my own perspective one of the reasons that led to the decline of the ottoman civilization because they were scattered their soldiers were fighting here there and also here and that was very bad thing for them after king or sultan Suleiman. Uh, there was a story behind all of these scenes, and I told you that, uh, unfortunately, he killed two of his uh, most important sons, uh, most of the strongest one, and uh, the uh, all of that uh, empire was uh, given to his uh, third son, uh, Salim the second. And Salim actually was fragile, weak, uh, and he just left all of these civilizations and all of these uh, countries uh, under the control of uh, the uh ministers and of course most of them were uh, corrupted that's why uh, the civilization of the german started to decline and the people who tried to take control of them uh, or to take their place uh, were shia muslim also but uh, they were constructed and they were uh, uh, centralized in nowadays iran they are called the suburbs and they took the city of Asfahan as uh, their capital city. And they started first to move uh, towards Asia and started to take control of uh, Iraq. And then uh, they started to move towards uh, Damascus and started to take control of uh, the cities uh, that uh, was one time under the Ottoman control. Uh, and actually both uh, the Ottoman and the Soviet Empire, they were Muslim empires and uh, they held it much uh, in just uh, spreading uh, Islam and both of these uh, people they were uh, Muslims and they were named uh, or called uh, Gunpowder Empires because uh, they were the first empires to use uh, the gunpowder uh, in uh, their war. Uh, that's approximately what we have studied all last week. Any question about that so far? No. Come on, guys. If you don't have a mic, you can even say in the chat if there are any of these points that you do not understand. I have spoken about uh, how two new powers started to arise and that uh, they were called or named or titled uh, the Ghana Powder Empire because of the use of uh, the empire. We have spoken about how the Ottoman started to conquer and take control of Constantinople and uh, changing its name into Istanbul. We have spoken also about uh, Suleiman uh, the Magnificent and that he was titled the Lawgiver in the Arab uh, uh, world and uh, Suleiman the Magnificent in Europe. Later we have spoken about how uh, the Ottomans started to control trade and that helped them much, especially that by controlling the Mediterranean Sea. That helped them much in uh, controlling uh, the trade. And later we spoke about the Ottoman society and it was uh, divided into three categories number one the men of the sword number two the men of the pen and number three the men of the husbandry three classes or three categories of the ottoman society we spoke also about religion and that they were muslims and they were sunni muslims not even the shisi muslim they were sunni muslim and they practiced the uh, principles of Islam and that they started to construct uh, mosques all over the empire and they started even to treat the conquer people uh, in a very very decent way yeah and even they included some of them in their uh, Janizaris and we said that Janizaris are uh, the elite force uh, of the Ottoman army so just imagine including and involving foreign people to work as uh, the elite uh, force in the Ottoman army and that actually helped it to mingle and mix the culture of the Ottoman people. Later we spoke about the literature and art and that they started to adapt literature and art from other civilization like the Persian and 
the Arabian and also the LED civilization. And uh, later we've spoken about uh, the decline of uh, the Ottoman and that was in the era of Salim the second. The rise of the Safavids, we have mentioned that uh, they uh, were Muslims, but Shiite Muslims, and uh, they started to arise from the place known today as uh, Iran. And they took the beautiful city of Asfahan as uh, their uh, capital city. And of course, because of that, uh, they started also to control uh, trade. So the last point to speak about uh, in this topic is uh, the decline of the Safavid Empire. So once again, why would you think any civilization or any empire will decline? If I ask you about any civilization, why? What? Weak rulers. Weak rulers, yes. Nice, what else? And attackers. Invaders. Invaders, nice. Teacher, uh, maybe corrupt uh, minister. Or... Bravo, corrupted uh, ministers. Nice, very good. So simply we can say it's uh, an aging dynasty. Becoming an aging dynasty will always held in uh, just the uh, uh, declining any civilization and by aging dynasty we tend to mean that uh, you have weak rulers you have corrupted officials uh, you have uh, discontent people uh, and you have uh, invaders and people asking for uh, the dynasty ruling uh, like becoming a new dynasty all of these uh, actions will help in the decline of uh, any other civilization money doesn't grow on trees yeah it does Of course, here we have a map of how the Soviet Empire started to arise and then decline. So they started first from the city of Iran nowadays, started to move towards parts of India, and later they turned to those in the Middle East. So that's actually going over the years and how they started to control this area. And now we see that the rule started to shrink. And that's because the new year becomes the Fagal and Meek. Later, the new ruler will come. He is a powerful one. So finally, you will find out they started to stretch once again and it started to increase in their occupied countries. So it's actually working upon who is ruling them. Okay, according to the Shah. For them, of course, we have the Shah is seen in this era, for example. So he needs to stretch his place. And unfortunately, at the end of Shah Hussein, the Soviet Empire declined a lot, and later came up as the third, and they started to take control of other people. So if you can see how it's just moving towards becoming power and fragile, power and fragile, power and fragile until finally they had nothing to control and actually they started to decline a lot. Okay, that was for the territories. So let's speak now about the reason for the decline. Abdurrahman, can you read please? Okay, a self of it glory slowly faded after the death of Shah Abbas and under continuing pressure from uh, Ottoman armies. Shitty scholars also challenged the authority of the Shah by stressing their own authority uh, to interpret law and determine government policy. They encouraged persecution of religious minorities, pushing, okay. uh, pushing Sunni Afghans to rebel. The rebels defeated imperial armies, captured Isfahan, and forced the last Safavid ruler to ab 
decade in 1722. Teach under the picture. Yes. Great last paragraph. In the, late in, the, in the late 1700s, a new dynasty, the Qajars, won control of Iran. They made Tehran capital and ruled until 1925. Still, the Safavids left a lasting legacy. Uh, they established Shiism firmly in Iran and gave Persians a strong sense of their own identity. So, to speak about the decline of the Safavid people, we will find out that uh, one major reason for the decline of the Safavid uh, was uh, the asking for more power by uh, the normal people, especially the scholars of the Shiite people. So, the glory for the Soviet people started to fade after the death of Shah Abbas, because Shah Abbas, he was uh, the strongest uh, one of them. And under him, or under his ruling, they started to stretch. But later, after he died, the Ottoman people and the Ottoman army started to take control once again. On the other hand, inside the society of the Soviet, we found out that the Shiite scholars, they wanted more authority. And because they wanted more authority, that helped in the decline of the empire. Because you cannot just rule, you cannot let anyone rule. So anyone asking for power, he shall not be given it. Okay? And actually our prophet said something like that. So right now, you are a scholar. You are uh, interested in religion. Why would you ask for authority? And because now uh, I'm a scholar. Okay, and I want more authority for myself. Uh, and this is, uh, authority will help me to do whatever I want. And even if I become corrupted. So this will later affect uh, the country we are living in. So not all people shall be given authority because it's a very, very bad. So the Shiite scholars, they challenged the, the authority. Challenged the authority. One of the most important uh, points for the decline of the Safavid Empire that uh, the Shiite uh, scholars uh, challenged the authority of the Shah and they uh, stressing their own authority to interpret uh, the laws. They thought that uh, we are the ones who understand the Holy Quran and we are the ones who interpret uh, uh, the laws of the country. That's why we shall be given uh, a very high position and also the laws must not be applied upon us. And this helped in just weakening uh, the empire and that led to the decline of the Soviet people and even determine the government policy and that's actually not your turn you are a scholar you are concerned with religion so it's not your turn to just determine the government policy okay so that helped in the decline of those people and they even Encouraged the persecution of religious minorities, persecution like killing the people which are outnumbered, the uh, few groups who were Sunni in their uh, civilization, they wanted them to be persecuted, meaning that they wanted them to die because they only wanted their system to thrive because if their system Thrived, they will obtain more authority, and that's actually very bad. So, of course, uh, of course, pushing the Sunni, Afghanistan to repel, uh, and the repel defeated the, the imperial armies and captured Asfahan and forced the last of the ruler uh, to abdicate in 1722. And now we can just see because uh, right now, if we made a very, very easy comparison between the Ottoman society and the Safavid society. The Ottoman, they mingled with other civilization and accepted people from all over the world to just come to them and to present with them and all of them lived in harmony. On the other hand, the Safavid people, they did not even accept other Muslims, not even other religions. Okay, but they did not accept the Sunni Muslim. And that was uh, one of the reasons that uh, the Afghanistani army started to march towards uh, Asfahan and capture it. 
Yet on the other hand, uh, in the late 1700s, uh, we have uh, a new dynasty, which called uh, Qajars. Qajars. They won control over Iran and they made Tehran their own capital city. And they ruled until 1925, which is uh, very, very near, not far. Still, the Safavid left uh, a lasting legacy. They established the Chizm firmly in Iran and gave uh, Persian a strong sense of their own uh, identity. So, although that uh, the Soviet Empire did not last uh, much or did not control uh, much area, on the other hand, they left for us uh, a beautiful uh, uh, heritage in their own uh, cities. Under Shah Abbas, art, architecture, and also learning flourished till Sorry, the Tayyip Musakas combined with uh, mathematical uh, precision created uh, this masterpiece, uh, the Shah Imam Mosque in uh, Asfahan, Iran. So, although that uh, the Soviet ended, yet uh, their uh, legacy still uh, followed us. Uh, and um, they also established the Shizm, uh, which is uh, the action of uh, practicing Shia or the Shia practice. Okay, firmly in both Iran and also give the Persian strong sense of their own identity. Uh, of course, for us Sunni Muslims, uh, Shism is very bad. Okay, we do not believe in their um, identity and they do not believe in ours. But once again, guys, we are just studying all of that from a third person view. Okay. We are just being objective to what in the history is. Okay, so once again, we're just studying about the history of all of these people in this civilization, whether they were good or they were bad, whether we uh, agree with them or disagree, disagree with them. All right, grade nine. Okay. So for the assessment here, we need to identify the central ideas. Number one, how did the Shah Abbas strengthen the Soviet empire and leave a lasting legacy in Persia? Who can answer this question? How did Shah Abbas strengthen the Safavid Empire and leave a lasting legacy in Persia? He created a powerful military force. Nice. And uh, he reduced taxes. Great. So, first of all, he started to take control of uh, the area here, and nowadays Iran, and by doing that, he started to gain, once again, the legacy of uh, his uh, own ancestor, the Persian. Because the Persian, they once controlled over huge parts of the world. So, he wanted to regain uh, the power of his uh, own people by taking control of that uh, area here. And he took the city of Asfahan as his own capital city and started to march towards the area here around Iran nowadays. So he was actually so powerful to leave a strong empire and started to strengthen that empire. And he left for us, of course, a lasting legacy in Persia because simply he wanted to regain what has been once captured by his own ancestor, the Virgin Empire. For the conclusion, which were the important characteristics of the Ottoman and the Soviet, Soviet Empire? From your own point of view, what are the important characteristics of both Ottoman and Soviet? Ryan?
Abdullah Furayan. Yes, teacher. From your own point of view, Abdullah, what are the most important characteristics of both the Ottoman and the Safavid empires? Uh, the army. The army? Yes. Okay. What about the army? Uh, in the offense and defense situations. Okay. The center and uh, how how they get knowledge. How they get what? The knowledge. They must have a, a way to study. Okay. Yeah, that's what I know. Okay. So simply to speak about that, uh, we need to speak about. Uh, the characteristics. Of course, for the characteristics, we tend to ask for uh, number one, how they dealt with their own uh, people, how they dealt with the foreigners, uh, and what are the connections uh, and those uh, people. So, for the Ottoman, for example, uh, they uh, were uh, Sunni Muslims, uh, they were uh, very good in dealing with the people and creating a strong society of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And of course, uh, they accepted. Uh, other civilizations and foreign people to live in their own capital city and even to participate in the government. On the other hand, the Safavid, although that they were strong, yet they did not accept foreigners and they did not even accept the Sunni Muslims and the people of the, the religion, the scholars, they just wanted to take more and more authorities in the civilization. In question number three, to identify cause and effect, what was one of the characteristics of the Ottoman Empire under the ruler Suleiman the Logover? Of course, the, this one we have just spoken about, which was mingling with other civilizations, accepting foreigner people, and actually that helped a lot in the era of Suleiman the Logover. That the Ottoman Empire started to thrive and also to accept more people in their own civilization and in their own society. To infer, why do you think the Ottoman and the Soviet rulers allowed some religion tolerance? Of course, religion tolerance because both of them they were Muslims, and Islam urges us to become tolerant with other people who are not Muslims. So the main reason for the tolerance of both the Ottoman and the Soviet is because both of them were Muslim civilizations. To summarize at the end, what were the two greatest impacts on the non-Muslim people on the Ottoman Empire in Eastern Europe? Of course, for the Ottoman, we have spoken about uh, this point that uh, the Ottoman, they accepted the, the non-Muslim people and they uh, applied them to work in uh, the Ottoman society. That's why the impact was very great for those uh, people, because they didn't feel different. Uh, the government itself, uh, they held uh, Muslim, Christians and even Jews, uh, the, uh, the common society, the common professions. Uh, we will find out that they were mingled between the religion and also the civilization. And that helped the Ottoman to thrive for many, many centuries. Any questions so far? No. Any part you need me to revise? Once known as Persia, the area encompassing and surrounding modern-day Iran has seen many empires rise and fall. One of these empires is the Sabawi. Today we'll take a look at this ruling power that governed over Iran during the 16th and 17th centuries. 
According to many historians, the Safavid Empire marked the beginning of modern Persia. As an empire, the Safavid succeeded in placing the nomadic people groups of the region under their consolidated power. One of the main ways they did this was through religion. According to many sources, the Safavid Empire had its beginnings in Sufism, a mystical sect of Islam. However, as time went on, the empire moved closer to Shiism, a sect of Islam that believes all religious authority must come to the direct lineage of Ali, the Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law. Believing that all other religions were heresy, the Safavids used their strong military force to force their Islamic Shiism to surrounding areas. In other words, it was definitely not an empire known for its tolerance. On the contrary, many would call it a theocracy, or a government formed and ruled by religious beliefs and rulers. As a theocracy, the Safavid rulers used their religious authority as a means to reign with rather unquestioned supremacy. Speaking of rulers, Shah Ismail is traditionally considered the first ruler of the Safavid Empire. Maybe a bit like America's George Washington, it was Shah Ismail who freed the Persians from the Ottoman Empire of modern-day Turkey. Moving further along in Persian history is Shah Abbas the Great. As his name implies, most scholars consider him to be the greatest emperor of the Safavid. Using the power of his theocracy, Shah Abbas strengthened the position of the emperor by limiting the power of local nobles. In other words, he let everyone know he was the head honcho in charge. Moving a bit away from politics, Shah Abbas the Great also enlarged the coffers of his empire. Being a bit of an opportunist, he opened up the doors of the empire to trade with Western powers, specifically the British. As a quite well-rounded ruler, Shah Abbas' rule also saw a flourishing of arts and culture. During his reign, the empire witnessed the building of opulent structures, the publishing of literature, and a great appreciation of poetry. After his death in 1629, the throne passed to his grandson. Unfortunately, his grandson seemed a bit more interested in partying than responsibility. With this, the empire began to weaken, and in the 18th century, the mighty Safavid Empire succumbed to internal strife and outside invasion. Persia, the area surrounding and encompassing modern-day Iran, was once ruled by the Safavid Empire. This empire governed over Iran during the 16th and 17th centuries. It marked the beginning of modern Persia. With its origin in Sufism, a mystical sect of Islam, the empire's religion was that of Shiism, a sect of Islam that believes all religious authority must come through the direct lineage of Ali, the prophet Muhammad's son-in-law. With its strong tie to Shiism, the empire was considered a theocracy, or a government formed and ruled by religious beliefs and rulers. Shah Ismail was the first ruler of the Safavid Empire. He freed the Persians from the Ottoman Empire of modern-day Turkey. As his name denotes, Shah Abbas the Great is considered the greatest emperor of the Safavids. Under his rule, he strengthened the position of the emperor. He also expanded trade, saw the building of opulent architecture, and ruled over a flourishing culture of the arts. Unfortunately, this era of prosperity would come to an end with the empire collapsing during the 18th century. So, Great Nine, any questions so far about uh, any of the Ottoman or the Soviet empires? No, teacher. Okay, if you have any question, have no hesitation to contact me. And once again, please try to finish your project maximum, maximum by next week. Okay? Thursday? Yeah, maximum Thursday next week. Uh, actually, some of the students have already started to send me the project. So, say, uh, Okay, some students have already started to send me the project since last week. So please do your best in order to just finish it uh, as soon as possible. Because of course, you know the changing in uh, the times. And uh, we just need to finish everything before the exam starts. Have a nice day, uh, grade nine, and see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very. Very well, goodbye.